Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Jamie Estock is a human factor scientist with 16 years of experience leading human factors projects in safety critical domains. Ms. Estock holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown and a master's degree in human factor psychology from George Mason University. Before coming to VA Pittsburgh, Ms. Estock managed multiple Department of Defense funded projects focused on enhancing the effectiveness of simulation based training systems for fighter pilots. She also led FAA and NASA funded efforts focused on improving runway safety at U.S. airports. In addition, Ms. Estock served as Human Performance Group Chairman on two major uh, marine accident investigations while employed at the National Transportation Safety Board. At VA Pittsburgh, Ms. Estock conducts human factors analyses on medical products to provide advice on the purchase of new products, mitigate safety issues with existing products, and evaluate the design of uh, future products. She also serves as co-director of the Patient Safety Fellowship and is responsible for training and mentoring future patient safety leaders. Jamie, I would now like to turn the program over to you. Good afternoon. Um, I want to start out by thanking the PA Patient Safety Authority for inviting me to present today. And I want to thank all of you for joining today's webinar. In the past, I've presented this material as an interactive live training session, and that was fairly well received by participants. So I really tried to incorporate as much of that active learning approach as possible in this webinar. My primary learning objective for this session is that you'll walk away viewing the world through a human factors lens. Now that objective may seem difficult to measure, but what I would expect to see at the end of this presentation is that you will be able to describe human factors as an academic discipline, recognize the influence of product design on human performance, identify design flaws that may have caused or contributed to adverse events, and document those design flaws in your adverse event reports. You may even find that your new human factors perspective seeps into your everyday life. So let's start with a definition of human factors. I like this definition provided by the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, which is the professional society for human factor scientists and practitioners. Human factors is an academic discipline that bridges psychology and engineering. Human factors experts apply what we've learned about people, primarily through the various fields of psychology, to the design or engineering of products that people use, environments in which they work, and jobs that they perform. So most people with academic degrees in human factors either graduate from a psychology or an engineering department. To date, there are 20 graduate programs that have received accreditation from the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. 14 of those programs are in psychology departments, and six are in engineering departments. And although there are other degree programs in Human Factors, the goal of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society accreditation is to ensure that educational programs appropriately and consistently prepare students for entering careers in Human Factors. So you can learn more about graduate programs in Human Factors through the HFBA, HFBS website, which I placed the link on this slide. So let's break down the uh, definition of Human Factors a bit more with an example of how products have been designed to address a common human error. So one thing we know about people is that they are goal-oriented in their task execution. And we also know that people often forget to complete the steps of a task that occur after the goal has been achieved. So with this vending machine example, our goal is to get a snack. And a common mistake or post-completion error is forgetting to take your change from the vending machine after retrieving your snack. Another common post-completion error that humans commonly make is forgetting our ATM card in the machine. 
Now, you're probably aware of at least one existing design solution to eliminate this error. So, for example, some ATM machines use a swipe mechanism instead of requiring you to insert your card. This design solution keeps the card in your hands at all times so you can't leave it in the machine. Another ATM, uh, other ATM machines require that you take your card before the money is dispensed. So this design solution simply moves the step of taking your card prior to the goal achieving step of retrieving your money. And I've actually seen a similar design solution applied to how cash back requests are handled at self-checkout lanes. Specifically, in the example on the right-hand side, at the Target self-checkout lane, you cannot complete your checkout until you've taken your cash back from the machine. So overall, the goal of Human Factors is to ensure that the products that people use maximize their performance and minimize the likelihood of error. Unfortunately, poorly designed products affect our ability to perform tasks efficiently and accurately. So in the next few slides, I'm going to ask you to answer some product use questions via the polling feature. First question, how do you open this door? How do you open this door? How fast are you going in this car? How fast are you going in this car? Which knob turns on the back right burner on this stove? Which knob turns on the back right burner of this stove? What is the patient's blood glucose level? And last question, what is the patient's blood glucose level? All right. So I'm going to pause just for a minute and allow you to reflect on how the different designs for the door, the speedometer, the stovetop, and the glucometer affected your performance during that activity. So what did you notice about the designs presented in the top row versus those presented in the bottom row? For example, did you respond faster with the designs presented in one row versus the other? Maybe you were more confident in your accuracy of the responses in one row versus the other? So what I observed from my side was a much higher accuracy of responses for the designs on the bottom row. So for example, with our glucometer, 100% of the people who responded to the question of what's the patient's blood glucose level correctly assessed that it was a 32. On the other hand, I had about 50% of the participants say that the uh, blood glucose level of the patient for the upper RRLO reading was 510. And 510 on this glucometer was actually an error code represented in the display. This patient's blood glucose level was also 32. So the purpose of that activity was really for you to become more consciously aware of how small differences in the design of products affect your performance. I also noticed that you were much faster in producing responses for the designs at the bottom row than the top row. So having this more conscious awareness of how design affects your performance is fundamental to really understanding the discipline of human factors. And that's because despite what our title might suggest, human factors experts don't fix people. Instead, we accept human behavior, their characteristics, abilities, and limitations, and focus on fixing products that humans have to interact with in the environments in which they work. 
we believe that the job, your job as healthcare providers is difficult enough. So we wanna make sure that the health for care products that you use and the environments in which you work are designed to maximize your ability to deliver safe and high quality care. And we do this through uh, leading research and quality improvement projects to inform the design of safer products, advise the purchase of new safe products, and identify and mitigate safety issues with existing products. So I'm gonna walk through a human factors project example in each of these three categories. An example design project is one that was conducted by my colleagues at the Phoenix VA. Prior to conducting this study, the authors discovered that poorly designed support materials resulted in improper cleaning of endoscopes. Specifically, they identified design flaws with the manufacturer produced visual aids, including poor visibility, high memory demand, and inadequate feedback. So in this study, the authors redesigned the visual aids based on human factors principles and compared the two designs in a reprocessing task. They hypothesized that the redesigned visual aid would facilitate both faster reprocessing and result in fewer errors. And in their study, they had 36 naive participants who were randomly assigned to see either the manufacturer provided visual aid or that redesigned visual aid on a wall at eye level while reprocessing endoscopes. Both groups also had access to the standard operating procedures. What they found was that 87% of the reprocessing tasks were completed accurately with the participants who saw the redesigned visual aid, whereas 45% were completed accurately with the manufacturer's visual aid. An example acquisition project was our evaluation of automated chest compression devices. VA Pittsburgh was considering the purchase of an ACC device for use in responding to in-hospital cardiac arrest, and they were leaning towards purchasing the Lucas II device on the right-hand side. They asked my team to conduct a human factors evaluation to inform this purchasing decision. And in our study, we had 29 registered nurses and respiratory therapists, folks who would ultimately use this device if it came, uh, if we purchased it. They had those, we had those folks participate in the evaluation of, the two, of two automated devices, the Zoll Autopulse, which is on the left, and Physio Controls Lucas, again, which is on the right. The participants used each device in a simulated resuscitation scenario involving an unconscious 45-year-old man in cardiac arrest. And since lengthy chest compression interruptions are a use-related hazard associated with these devices, we compared chest compression interruption times to apply the device to the patient, adjust the position of the device on the patient, and remove the device and resume manual compressions, because these are three common tasks required for using an ACC device. What we found was that Autopulse outperformed the Lucas II with a significantly shorter interruption time to apply the device to the patient, and also a significantly shorter interruption time to remove the device and resume manual compressions. Now remember, prior to our study, the facility was leaning towards purchasing the Lucas II device. So this uh, showed the opposite result in terms of our decision. However, the chest compression interruption times of greater than 30 seconds to apply either device was significantly longer than the American Heart Association recommends. So as a result of our study, VA Pittsburgh decided not to purchase either ACC device, which saved the facility money and ensured the best outcomes for our patients who experience in-hospital cardiac arrest. So an example implementation project was our point of care glucometer evaluation. AccuCheck Inform 2 is the most commonly used point of care glucometer in the VA system. 
And prior to the study, we discovered that the OcuCheck Inform 2's results screen will display the same critically low blood glucose level six different ways depending on how the glucometer is configured. In this graphic here, all six displays represent a 32 bl blood glucose. So our study aimed to identify which configuration would be least likely to result in treatment errors. And we hypothesized that the RRLO reading would result in the most treatment errors and that the numeric 32 reading would result in the fewest treatment errors. We used a within-subject design where 66 nurses participated in two equivalent computer-based scenarios. The participants were blinded to the specific objective of this study. And in the scenarios, the nurses were asked to interpret glucometer readings and make treatment decisions for patients with subtle symptoms of hypoglycemia where one had a 32 reading on their glucometer and the other had an RRLO reading. What we found was similar to what we saw today in the polling question. All of our nurses delivered the correct treatment when presented with a numeric result on the glucometer. However, only 89% of those same nurses delivered the correct treatment when presented with an RRLO result. Delivering an incorrect treatment to a hypoglycemic patient can and has resulted in serious patient injury and even deaths. So our study demonstrated that these obscure error codes presented on glucometers can facilitate incorrect treatment errors. And based on the results of our study, we created AccuCheck Inform 2 configuration recommendations and disseminated them across the VA system. We disseminated our recommendations to non-VA hospitals through our open access article in the Joint Commission Journal on Quality and Patient Safety. You can find a reference to that article at the end of this presentation. In addition, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices published our glucometer configuration recommendations in their safe medicine newsletters. Now, those are just three example projects to demonstrate how human factors experts can support healthcare facilities in the design, acquisition, and safe use of medical products. Now that you have a better understanding of human factors and a greater awareness of how product design can affect human performance, let's talk about the consequences of bad design. So in this section, we'll practice applying a human factors mindset while investigating adverse events. I'll start with the obligatory reference to reason Swiss cheese model, I'm sure you all have seen it in almost every patient safety presentation. However, I suspect that many of you are not 100% clear on how to interpret reasons model. So in fact, a 2005 study assessed how well quality and safety professionals who claim to be familiar with the model could interpret it. And the author found notable variability among participants as to what the various features of the model represent. But I think with a bit of clarification, not only can reasons model be understood, but it can be applied during adverse event uh, investigation. So here's my attempt to clarify reasons model a bit. Reason said when an adverse event occurs, the important issue is not who blunders, but how and why the defense has failed. Therefore, I represent the active failures committed by the healthcare professional outside of the defensive layers. And I acknowledge that active failures will occur because humans are susceptible to error. This revision helps me, at least, stay focused on plugging the holes in the defensive barriers. So these defensive barriers or layers of the Swiss cheese exist to prevent errors made by that healthcare professional from reaching the patient, which I represent on the other side of the barriers. And we also know that some barriers are stronger than others. Weaker barriers are those that are highly dependent on humans, such as training. So for example, for training to be successful, the instructor must create comprehensive content, 
and they have to be able to deliver that content effectively. In addition, the trainees must be paying attention during the training, and they also have to remember what they learned afterwards. So the more humans are involved, the more opportunity for error. So I've chosen to represent weaker barriers as those that have more holes. Stronger barriers, on the other hand, are less dependent on humans, so I represent those with fewer holes. Now, closing a hole in one of the stronger barriers will be more likely to prevent errors made by our healthcare professionals from reaching the patient. And this is why, to me, it's so important to inspect medical products and environments after a reported event. So what I'm gonna have you do is keep reasons model in mind, and I'll give you some time to read this adverse event description. This is an actual event that occurred in New England when during a cervical spine fusion operation at an outpatient surgery center, an anesthesiologist accidentally administered lidocaine instead of Hespan to the patient. Unfortunately, the patient ultimately died of that acute lidocaine toxicity. And here are the actions taken against that anesthesiologist involved. So the question is, do you think these corrective actions will prevent this adverse event from occurring again? I'm hoping that your answer to that question is no. Um, finding and training the specific individual involved in an adverse event will not prevent an event from happening again. In fact, with this particular event, we had a similar near miss occur in the VA system around this same time. So let's take a look at how we responded to the event. In our near miss, a VA nurse anesthetist found an incorrectly stocked lidocaine bag in the bin of the anesthesia cart where the HES band is normally stored. Fortunately, the nurse found this prior to the beginning of the surgery. Instead of finding someone to blame or retrain, our chief of anesthesia looked for stronger actions to prevent this near miss from becoming an adverse event. What he identified was that the design of the medication labels was a contributing factor in this near miss, noting that the Hespan and the lidocaine labels look very similar, not only within the drawer, as you can see on the left-hand side, but even after they had been hung on the rail. As a result, we conducted a study to measure the effect of label design on medication errors in a high-stress anesthesia crisis scenario similar to the one that was described in the case study. Specifically, we compared the current labels to labels that were redesigned based on published design recommendations. So the redesign label incorporated, which is on the right, incorporated three recommendations that had already had some preliminary evidence to support their adoption. The first one was using opaque white medication labels on IV bags to improve legibility. The second recommendation is using inverted text to highlight key medication information on the label. And the third recommendation is distributing information across a front and back panel to reduce clutter. Now, you probably noticed that we avoided color coding. We actually did that on purpose because, believe it or not, the existing research to support color coding medication labels is mixed at best. And we, um, and in fact, most safety, recommend, uh, safety organizations do not recommend that. I think I saw a question come in. This is inverted text, so that's when you have a white text on a dark background. In our study, 96 anesthesia trainee participants were randomly assigned to either the redesigned or the current label condition. 
participants were blinded to the study's focus on medication label design. And each participant was the sole anesthesia provider in a simulated operating room scenario involving an unexpected vascular injury. Upon that injury, the surgeon immediately asked the participant to administer HESPAN to the simulated patient. At that point, that anesthesia cart contained three 500 milliliter bags of HESPAN and one 500 milliliter bag of lidocaine. We hypothesized that re the redesigned labels would help the participant avoid selecting the lidocaine from the cart. And what we found was that the redesigned label significantly decreased the odds that anesthesia providers would select lidocaine from the cart. And this might go without saying, but if the provider did not select the lidocaine from the cart, they did not go on to administer it to the patient. So more generally, we think the study highlighted that corrective actions focused on product design can have a significant impact on reducing adverse events as opposed to blaming and retraining the individual involved. So we think, again, this demonstrates that we should start shifting this focus on adverse event investigations away from the question of how could that nurse or pharmacist or physician have made that error, more towards how could the design of the product or environment have encouraged the error. So applying this human factors perspective during adverse event investigations is more likely to result in, correct, in stronger corrective actions. And a simple and practical way to do this is to walk through a user's task in as close to a real world conditions as possible while considering the question, are there any design flaws that could have encouraged this error? So what we're going to do in the next few slides is practice applying this method to different adverse events. So I'll give you a minute to read through this event description. So in this event, the nurse intended to infuse Alteplase at a dose of one milligram per hour, and after seeing a change in the condition of the patient's foot, the nurse noticed that the Alteplase was infusing at a rate of one milliliter per hour instead of a dose of one milligram per hour as ordered. So at this point, we would want to have a nurse walk us through the task of programming an infusion with the pump involved. Since I can't use video in this webinar, I'm just going to use some screenshots and talk you through the steps of the nurse's programming task. So when programming a, an infusion pump, the first or this particular one, what the nurse first does is select the dose field using the arrow key on the right-hand side. Oops. Then the next thing they do is enter the dose values using the keypad at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. Once they have entered the dose, the rate value will automatically populate. Then they would select the volume to be infused using the arrow key on the right-hand side next to the VTBI, and they would use the keypad to enter the VTBI value. Once they have done that, they will confirm all the values present, and they would press the Start button. So from this walkthrough, what we should note is that the design of the pump's interface doesn't match the way the nurse enters the data. Specifically, a nurse starts by entering the dose, which as you can see, the dose field is the last one listed on the screen. The rate field, however, is the first uh, field listed on the screen, and if you recall, that's where our nurse accidentally entered the dose value. 
So the design flaw that contributed to this adverse event would be that the order of the fields does not match the, data, the user's data entry task. Now in the next few slides, what I'm gonna do is give you adverse event scenarios and ask you to identify the primary design flaw that contributed to each event. You're going to answer the multiple choice question via the polling feature like we did earlier, but this time we're gonna debrief on each scenario before moving on to the next one. And I'm also gonna give you a little bit longer time to uh, review each scenario and the related graphics before answering the question. Okay. Here's our first scenario. Again, I'll give you some time to read through the description, review the images, and consider which of the design flaws was a causal factor in this adverse event. Now what you should note is that the multiple choice options might list some distractors, and it also might list more than one design flaw. So what I really want you to do is select the one flaw that if fixed could have prevented this adverse event. So let's walk through some of the options here. Placing the sanitizing station behind the door is, I will agree, a poor design. But in this case, it didn't contribute to this event since we know that the nurse used the hand sanitizer when entering patient two's room. A crowded sink, also probably not ideal, but again, was not a causal factor in this particular event. Not having a contact precaution sign outside of patient one's room is a problem. This However, we know that the nurse was aware of and followed patient one's contact precautions, so again, did not contribute to this particular adverse event. What most likely occurred in this event was that the nurse accidentally washed her hands with lotion instead of soap, making the location of that lotion dispenser the primary design flaw in the patient's room. Now, fortunately, this environment design flaw has a very easy fix. So if a lotion dispenser is moved away from the sink area, people will not accidentally use it to wash their hands. So let's try another adverse event. And again, I'll give you time to read through this event description, but I do wanna point out a few things on the image. So the top part of the image shows the ESU generator or electrosurgical unit generator. It has one bipolar receptacle on the far left and two monopolar receptacles, one in the middle and one on the right. And below the generator is a picture of the bipolar forceps. So again, what we're looking for here is the one flaw if fixed that could have prevented this adverse event, remembering that the multiple choice options may include other design flaws. Okay, so we'll go through each of the responses again, hopefully as the results come up for you guys. So it's true the instrument receptacle labels could be improved, absolutely, but Chances are that better, better labeling is unlikely to prevent this adverse event from happening again. Um, I also would agree that the bipolar label should probably be color coded to match its buttons, in this case white, but again, don't expect that this change would prevent the adverse event. On the other hand, if the bipolar plug was unable to fit into the monopolar receptacle, this adverse event would not have occurred. And chances are you've seen a design fix like this in other areas. So one example is the diesel fuel nozzle, 
which is actually too large to fit into your gasoline fuel tank inlet. So even if you drove up, weren't paying attention, accidentally tried to use it, you would not be able to put diesel fuel into your gasoline fuel tank. All right, so we've got one more adverse event. Which design flaw, if fixed, could have prevented this adverse event? So although it wasn't ideal in this situation, there are cases where a user might not want the pump to start at a previously stored value and would want the pump to start at zero RPM. And having a tilting display is actually a positive design feature because it allows the user to adjust the display to their line of sight. So the primary design flaw in this particular adverse event was the lack of any protection against accidental shutoff. Even our cell phones are better protected from accidental shutoff by requiring a two-step shutdown process. And that's very scary because accidentally shutting down our phone has very minor consequences in comparison to accidentally shutting down a cardi cardiopulmonary bypass pump. So the purpose of that activity was really for you to practice focusing your investigative efforts on identifying design flaws that could have caused or contributed to adverse events. In that um, example, in the examples, I had to ask you to select the most consequential design flaw, but in reality, if you can identify any design flaw that could have affected the user's performance, you have successfully applied a human factors perspective. Remember, I'm not asking you to become human factors experts. In other words, you don't have to worry about coming up with the design solution. That's our job. My hope is that you're better equipped to recognize design flaws and motivated to report them. So we'll just talk quickly about that reporting. One place to report design flaws is in your internal adverse event reporting system. At the VA, we use the Joint Patient Safety Reporting System, or JPSR. Now, since reporting systems vary by healthcare facilities, I can't provide specific advice as to how to report these issues within your system. But I do want to take this opportunity to encourage you to document product and environment design flaws as part of your adverse event reports so that it can be tracked and analyzed um, at your facility. And I would also encourage you to report all medical device problems directly to the FDA. So I've included a link to the FDA webpage where patients and healthcare professionals can report medical device problems. If you're reporting as a consumer or a patient, you can select the red button, and if you are reporting as a healthcare professional, you would select the green button. Both options will bring up an electronic form for you to complete with details about the medical device problem that you identified. And it doesn't have to be an adverse event. It could be a near miss or, or anything that you noticed about, about that device. The reason it's important for you to report to the FDA is because they have the most comprehensive database of medical device problems. And furthermore, unlike our internal reporting systems, the FDA database is open to analysis by anyone, including human factors experts, manufacturers, healthcare professionals, and even patients. So this all-inclusive open access database facilitates better research and more rapid improvements in the design and use of medical products. So I, I really just want to make uh, clear reference to this opportunity for you guys to get this information and, and help us design better products for you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Rick for questions. Well, thanks, Jamie. Uh, that actually concludes the uh, slide. Uh, presentation portion of our program. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do now is to begin our uh, Q&A session, our question and answer period. So if you have any questions, please type in, in the uh, Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. 
And again, uh, that would involve your hovering at the bottom of the screen, and you should see three dots in a circle. And then what you do is click the uh, dots to open the Q&A panel and direct your question to all panelists, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so I, I don't see at this point, Jamie, any questions in the Q&A uh, panel, but um, what I'd like to ask is, you know, uh, in, you know, in relation to your presentation and all, with regard to the facilities that are represented on, on the call today, uh, if, you know, they don't have access to human factors experts in their facilities, you know, uh, what can they do to, you know, access a, a, an expert or get expert um, advice with situations such as this? Okay, great. So I think um, a good place to start is the HFES website, which I provided um, a link to in the slides. Um, on the website, you can find the academic programs that house experts in academia in human factors, and a, usually a descriptor of those programs that will tell you which ones are focused on healthcare-related issues. Um, the other thing the HFES website has is a consultant directory. So you can go through a list of uh, human factors experts who have, you know, chosen to publish their information on the consultant directory, and again, seek those that um, are available to work on healthcare-related issues. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm here, and I yield a lot of questions within the VA system and, and outside the VA, um, so I'm always happy to, to take questions personally and point you in the right direction for the particular issue that you guys might be having at your facility. Okay. Actually, uh, we, we have a number of questions that have just started popping up uh, actually through the chat, so I'll try to get through the, uh, as many as we can here. But uh, first question is, do you have any suggestions for creating a culture around identifying and recognizing these types of errors? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. I know a lot of facilities are um, presenting this type of material less under the, the header of human factors, but more in, in terms of cultures of safety. Um, and so I think it's, you know, we, what we've found here, honestly, that's been the most successful is having people be involved in these projects. and involved in this type of work and even seeing some of these examples that I that I displayed today, which you guys are more than welcome to use. Um, certainly the glucometer one is a pretty powerful one. But what we found is that the participants, I guess an un, uh, unexpected uh, positive consequence of having participants uh, be part of our human factor studies is that they adopt this human factors perspective just from participating in one of our, our studies. So any time you can just kind of give people the opportunity to see these examples and have their own aha moment, again, chances are it will seep into pretty much everything that they do. I, I even have a, had a physician colleague once tell me that ever since he's worked with me, he can't even look at the, his uh, espresso machine the same anymore without being frustrated with its design. And, and for me, I laugh because I think that's a great success. You know, it's, it's like changing hearts and minds one person at a time. Well, thanks. Uh, an another question that actually came up is, uh, can we report packaging concerns to the FDA? Uh, for example, poorly designed packaging to identify Lasix, uh, Lasix versus Latex, I'm sorry, uh, products like catheters. Yeah, I would absolutely report those to the FDA as well. What I'm not certain of is if that link that I provided is the best place to do that. So I do know the FDA also tracks drug-related uh, adverse events, so I would, with that particular issue, I'd probably uh, seek out the reporting system for the drug-related adverse events and just make sure to cite that particular um, issue with the packaging in, in that reporting system, but unfortunately, I, I don't um, know that website off the top of my head. Okay, and actually, this this person's really uh, paid quite a lot of attention to your presentation, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure how you're going to answer this, but uh, they had an observation about uh, 
uh, your uh, slide with regard to the uh, diesel, you know, fuel tanks and, and uh -huh. you know, trying to eliminate those errors, but they're saying that, uh, and I assume that this is in relation to the the lar larger nozzle where you can't put it in the diesel in your your car. They said, but can't they put the regular gas in the diesel tanks? No, oh, that's true. I suppose that's that's probably a problem. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll have to get on that. I've never tried that way, the other way around, but um, I suppose that could be a risk. I, I think people that maybe have the diesel engines are a little bit more self-aware because of you know mm -hmm. the the need to search that out. But yeah, I, I I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, but I thought that was an interesting observation. No, that's on, a, that's on a really point. good point. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, if there are any other questions, I, I, we're running out of time, and I, I don't want us to go over. So <clears throat> but, uh, we could f have you respond to, uh, to questions that can. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you.